Good evening. I'm Adam Irby, curator of fine and decorative arts here at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight to, for a special joint program with the Museum of the American Revolution. This coming weekend, Mount Vernon is having our annual Revolutionary War weekend. And one of the typical parts of the program that's really exciting to us is to have the Museum of the American Revolution's reproduction of George Washington's tents come down here and be set up on the lawn at Mount Vernon. Unfortunately, this year we're not going to be able to do that, but we're going to have this program uh, is sort of a second best to that. Uh, we have today, tonight, uh, Tyler Putman with the Museum of the American Revolution and I are going to give you a tour of the Museum of the American Revolution's recreation of George Washington's tents. Uh, Dr. Um, Proud to be uh, joined by Dr. Tyler Putman. Tyler is Manager of Gallery Interpretation at the Museum of the American Revolution, where he has done a number of these wonderful programs on, um, on, on Zoom and various programs over the course of the pandemic, including an artist and workshop series, Living History at Home, Meet the Revolution interviews, and um, at inter interviews with artists and experts on the Museum of the American Revolutionary Wars website. Uh, on a more personal note, Tyler is a good friend of mine. We were uh, in graduate school at the Winterton Program in American Material Culture a few years ago, and Tyler, um, Tyler and I uh, had many adventures back in that time. I wanted to also remind you that tonight's program, we have a wonderful uh, offer between a uh, joint program between us and the Museum of the American Revolution, where if you visit, uh, if you're a member of Mount Vernon or of the Museum of the American Revolution and you visit the other institution, you get 30% off on your admissions if you show your, uh, your membership to the other institution. And that goes on through the end of the year 2021. Uh, we have a great partnership with these two organizations. We're always working back and forth. But without further ado, I'd introduce Tyler Putman to introduce you to Washington's Tents. Thanks, Adam. It's really great to join everyone. You know, normally, right around this time of year, uh, one of the highlights of our spring is we get to take our replica tents to uh, Washington's home. We take Washington's wartime home to his uh, peacetime home. So we would be set up in front of Mount Vernon. Many of you may have seen us with these tents at Mount Vernon. And, you know, the best part of my weekend is talking to some of you, showing off the tent, catching up with Adam over lunch. And uh, we're really excited to do kind of a virtual version of that this evening. So I'm actually here inside the Museum of the American Revolution. I'm in the Alan B. Miller Theater. And behind me is a projection, part of our film, that's showing you a piece of Washington's tent. And if you stick around, we've got some really amazing objects and artifacts that we will um, reveal as Adam and I go through. But we wanted to start by showing you a new project of the museum, uh, which is kind of a sneak peek. This is actually not available on our website yet. It's called the Virtual First Oval Office Project. The replica tents that we made starting in 2013 in collaboration with Colonial Williamsburg, places like Mount Vernon that own the real things that we replicated, are called the First Oval Office Project. Just kind of a fun title to suggest that this oval tent was in many ways the first place that Washington exerted his authority as something new, as a Republican general, someone who's gonna be unquestionably in charge of the troops, but also demonstrate that he was willing to go on campaign, that he was not gonna put on airs. He was gonna live in the field with his men. So last fall, we took the replica tents out to the Brandywine Valley and we took 360 degree photographs of them uh, with a really talented photographer and producer named Brandon Hall. So the real tent behind me, Washington's actual tent still survives, but we also have newly made replicas. And that's a big challenge to sort out sometimes because didn't I see the tent at Mount Vernon or at Monmouth? You saw the replica and the real one still exists. So just like the amazing objects you can see at Mount Vernon, you can come here to the museum and see the real thing. But what if you can't visit the museum? What if all you have is a computer connection. We can take you into this 360 degree view of Washington's encampment as it might have looked on a bright fall day in the war-torn Brandywine Valley 
and we can introduce you to the, all the different people and experiences and objects that Washington would have encountered and lived among for eight years of the Revolutionary War. So tonight, Adam and I actually wanted to have a conversation about the virtual replicas we're going to see and the real things that informed this project to reimagine Washington's headquarters complex as it might have looked during the war. So I'm going to take you into what's called the office chamber, or the inner chamber of the tent. It's essentially a tent within a tent. You can see there's a small kind of house-shaped or milk carton-shaped inner chamber made out of a, a slightly more gray or beige fabric inside this large oval tent. I'm just going to pan around for a moment so you can get a view. There's a table set as if Washington might be having a meal alone on this particular evening. There are these folding camp stools. You can see the walls are opened and hooked down in certain ways that would have allowed this tent to be adjustable and ventilated, kind of multi-purpose. You could button it all up for privacy and warmth, or you could even take the walls entirely off, just use it for shade. And through this space, you can just make out Washington's bed which is separated by layers of fabric, curtain walls, its own bed hangings, a separate roof to that chamber. So this small space, maybe 10 feet by 11 feet, this was Washington's inner sanctum. This was the place where he wrote the letters that marked the high and low moments of the war, where he had small, intimate meetings with staff officers. It was also the home of William Lee, who we're going to talk about a little later. So in this inner chamber, you can already see there's an enormous amount of detail. When this resource debuts, you'll be able to click on each of these little icons to learn more about Washington's papers or lighting or even where Washington went to the bathroom. But we have the amazing opportunity tonight not just to show you these incredible photographs or to zoom in on every little detail which you can view from your couch at home, but to also look at the actual objects that Washington carried during the war that helped us imagine what his life on campaign was like. So Adam and I are gonna kind of switch back and forth in this conversation, and I wanted to throw it to him because we've got a couple objects with Adam right now that we can see in these 360 photos and Adam can tell us about in real life. So Tyler has just shown you the fully assembled reproduction bed that, uh, that, George, that George Washington slept in during the American Revolution. And we have the real authentic object that George Washington had uh, right here in front of us today. Now, it doesn't look like a bed sitting up, sitting in front of me, but it is. It is a bed that is a, called a camp bed. And the, what's wonderful about a camp bed is these were something in sort of military campaigns in Europe for centuries. Um, that The bedstead itself, which is the wooden elements of the bed, all fold up and can be put into a bag and carried away as you're moving from camp to camp uh, during a war. So I have it partially set up for us today, and this is one that descended in George Washington's family. It's likely the one that he bought in the 1770s during the American Revolution, and I have it partially set up for us today. It folds down even smaller. These legs that you see here, they have little iron hooks on the side. You unhook that, and you can fold the fold the um, fold the leg up underneath it, and it all neatly compacts into, and you can put it into a canvas bag. So the bedstead itself opens up; it's on hinges that expand out this way. So you get something like a little bit over a six foot long bedstead on which you put a uh, a sacking bottom, which is the layer of, um, of canvas that holds the mattress up. Then you put a couple of horsehair mattresses. They can, all, they can be folded and rolled up, and you put those on there in a little feather bed and your sheets, and you, there you have a bed. The one very important thing about 18th century beds is that on the best, very best bedsteads, you had a um, canopy that went over the top. This canopy was to hold curtains up. The curtains in the winter would have kept you warm. Your body heat would have kept you warm. And in the summer, you could put mosquito galls over top of these, on the, on, on, or rather than 
the, uh, the curtains and it would have kept mosquitoes out of your bed. So this bedstead is missing an important part, which is the tester. And the tester would attach to that brass element that you see there and go back to the back side of the bed. And that really held up the curtains. It was sort of a wooden lath structure that held the bed, held the curtains up. So this is a really remarkable object to have. Very few of these survive in uh, from 18th century America or from England uh, as well. And we're excited to have it and have the Museum of the American Revolution reproduce it and be able to use it out there today. Um, I'll turn it back over to Tyler for one second to uh, lead us to the next topic. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I, I'm really just excited about this camp bed too. You know, we're about to release this new virtual first level office project, but we'll also have a video of the assembly of our reproduction camp bed. So you get to see all those pieces Adam was mentioning, how they go together and how it, how compact it was, how it was really a portable thing. So I wanted to take you into the inner chamber where we are and let's uh, imagine it's getting a little darker in the evening. Here it is lit by candles. You can see this is actually a natural light photograph with a relatively long exposure, but even with just two candles, it stays pretty light inside. That fabric wall sort of reflects the light in, retains warmth if it's a little cool out. And we mentioned that Washington is about to uh, dine at this table. He often ate with other people in houses or in the dining tent, which we'll explore in a moment. But say he was eating alone, we've got the table set for that. And here on this camp stool, is a pretty strange looking object. It's a little hard to make out in this image. I'll zoom in on it. And uh, I'll also note that one of my favorite little Easter eggs in this interactive is that there's a spider on the wall here that we captured in our photographs. But you can see there's a, a leather, black leather bag, big handle on it. Its lid is flopped open. Uh, it's probably about the size of a picnic basket, which might be a hint as to how it was used. This is called a canteen which is different than a soldier's canteen, the water vessel they would have carried over their shoulders. But it's an example of one of the canteens that Washington used. And I believe Adam actually has one with him, which looks a little different than this, but helped inform how we uh, recreated it. And I'm standing here with one of the three original Washington canteens that we have here in the collection. This is one that we believe George Washington purchased in the 1750s and used initially in the French and Indian War. And it's one that he kept on using through, uh, through the American Revolution. You can see it's leather. So it's uh, over the years, the leather has dried up and, uh, and changed shape quite a bit. Um, but this is Washington's canteen and you would have kept inside of it. This lid opens up and there would have been bottles that could have been kept in there and other foodstuffs for when a Washington was going. So you had, you can have alcoholic beverages that were kept in here and other foodstuffs kept in the little pouch that you see here. Um, this is a really remarkable object in that it's one of the few that stayed here at Mount Vernon throughout the Mount Vernon's entire history. So when the Mount Vernon Ladies Association took over in 1860, they found three of Washington's uh, French and Indian War and Revolutionary War canteens that they uh, were given to them by the last private owner, John Augustine Washington III. Um, these have had long lives. And um, when Tyler and I were in graduate school with the Winterton Program, there's a companion program called the Winterton Program in uh, Conservation. And the conservators were working on that this, this piece in the conservation labs. And so this has been meticulously preserved uh, in a way that will, will keep the leather from further folding up, but it's a really exciting object to have out here. Adam, that's really cool. I actually did not know that um, the conservation program at Winterthur worked on that piece. So that's really an amazing connection. I, I think about things like our, we have one of Washington's portmanteau, these leather duffel bags that he carried on campaign and how that leather survived 250 years and, and we can still look at it and even in some cases still operated pieces of it, I think it's just stunning. It really is, I, it's very cool. 
I wanted to show you guys the exterior of the sleeping tent. So we've walked outside of the tent. Um, if you look closely, you might recognize this dashing commander in chief's guardsman who is um, guarding the doorway of the tent, clean shaven, unlike tonight. But imagine uh, that you're a commander in chief's guard, or you are uh, a paid servant, a cook, or a laundress, or you're an enslaved person like William Lee, who traveled with Washington for most of the Revolutionary War. Part of your job would have been maintaining the household and the complex that traveled with Washington, packing things up, taking them out, securing enormous amounts of paperwork, or even going into what we call the baggage chamber of the tent. So we were in the inner chamber. I'll take you guys back there for just a moment. Here's the inner chamber. We'll recognize that. There's Washington's bed chamber. There's the bed Adam was talking about. If we jump over to the other kind of half circle end of this oval, Washington's baggage chamber was a storage area, but also it was a preparation area, the sort of place where William Lee um, might have prepared Washington's toilet, his personal dressing area, his shaving area, dressed Washington's hair. It was also possibly where William Lee slept in this small part of the tent. And that would have allowed him to access the outside through this door or to walk down these narrow hallways next to the inner chamber so that he could access the bed chamber or the central room, perhaps without interrupting a meeting that was happening in the middle. And this was also, we think, where Washington stored some of his baggage and the containers that would have traveled with him. Washington traveled with, uh, at some points, there were 18 wagons load, wagon loads worth of equipment. So an enormous amount of papers and food and uniforms and supplies. And I, I think Adam has at least one example of the sort of camp equipage, the containers that traveled with Washington during the war with him. That's right, Tyler. I have one of the most remarkable uh, examples of Washington's trunks that survives uh, to this day. This is one of Washington's travel trunks. It, he, and it is one of the best documented uh, examples that we have. Washington purchased this particular trunk in April of 1776 from a man named John Head in Boston. It was this, Washington was in, at, at the end of the siege of Boston. He was getting ready to go to New York City uh, where, for the siege of New York, and he needed trunks to hold his voluminous correspondence. Um, Washington, throughout the American Revolution, understood the importance of the documents that he kept and that they were going to be important to posterity. And so this trunk here is one that we know that Washington used to hold all of his important documents. And over the course of the American Revolution, there became more and more uh, of these trunks. But this is one we know he used. And if you look at the top here, there's a wonderful little copper plate that has inscribed on it, General Washington. And, but then underneath it, there are these little tack heads. They're like sort of what we think of as upholstery tacks, and they used them in the same way in the 18th century. And you see the letters I, H, and the number 1775. What we think happened here, we know Washington bought, I is, was also used interchangeably as J in the 18th century before, uh, and so what we think happened is Washington needed this trunk. Head had ordered this truck trunk for himself, but he needed, uh, but he knew Washington needed it. So he sold it to Washington for two pounds, six shillings. The trunk was likely made in 1775. Washington bought it the next year. Um, so this trunk travels with Washington through the revolution. The, it's wooden underneath the, uh, underneath the piece. Uh, that's secured with uh, various uh, nails and other things, but it's covered on the outside with and uh, with what it looks like leather now. It was originally an animal pelt, um, and it was called a hair trunk. So you can see on the top little follicles from whatever animal this would have been, and then over on the side you can see some of the hair itself. Um, so Washington used this trunk, stored his documents in here. And in 1781, Washington hired a man named Richard Barrick 
to organize all of his correspondence and copy out everything in the revol the war wartime correspondence. Varick worked on that from 1781 to 1783, uh, and then these papers came back here to Mount Vernon. This trunk in the 19th century became a relic of the Washington of George Washington, and it was owned by his step granddaughter Eliza Custis, and she took it with her, had it repaired in Georgetown, so there are signs of the repairs on the inside. But this is a piece that Washington really used through the war. And we can even tell some of the documents that he, he would have kept in there. So it's a really remarkable piece and very evocative of the general himself. I think it's amazing that Washington's luggage survives from the Revolutionary War. And I wanted to show you guys a brief glimpse at the baggage tent, which is something that doesn't survive. So we know from the receipts from Washington's purchases early in the Revolutionary War that he bought a set of tents from a man named Plunkett Fleeson, uh, one of the greatest names of the revolution or Harry Potter, your, your choice uh, of the period. And Plunkett Fleeson operated right down the street from where I'm sitting today. Washington acquired the things he needed to go on campaign, a large sleeping marquee, like the one here, but also a baggage tent. So a baggage tent was sort of like a, an extra tent to put all your baggage in and we'll take a peek into ours. It has a couple crates, one of the leather portmanteaus, and that's quite possibly where the trunk that Adam just showed us would have stayed uh, during the Revolutionary War on campaign, out of the weather, and also closely guarded. As Adam mentioned, the paperwork that Washington was generating uh, at the time and in the years to come was recognized as being um, critically important to the nation's history, so it was carefully preserved and secured. Washington also purchased a dining tent, and the dining tent that survives today, probably made early in 1778 uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, while the army's at Valley Forge, it is actually at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and it is an enormous tent. It's even larger than the sleeping marquee that some of you may have seen here at the Museum of the American Revolution. And a few of you may have seen this set up at Mount Vernon. We've also brought the replica dining tent there, but you can see it is a really long, oval, similar in some ways to the sleeping tent. But this is the sort of tent that Washington would have used for more formal meetings, councils of war, dinners. So you can imagine the center with a long table running down it, maybe being able to seat uh, 20 or 30 officers and civilians for a candlelit dinner with Washington or hosting the planning meetings where Washington and Rochambeau strategize the Yorktown campaign, for example. And to give you a sense of what uh, the dining tent was like inside and the sort of people who were there, the sort of objects that were used there, I understand that Adam has gotten permission to share a really amazing loan object that you guys have at Mount Vernon right now of someone who would have been a familiar face in the dining tent. Certainly. So uh, we have a portrait here today. I'll You've been wondering who was standing behind me. This is the Marquis de Lafayette, um, who was a Frenchman who came over here at 21 years old to serve under George, volunteer and serve under George Washington in the cause uh, of the American Revolution. Washington befriended him. He very much became like a son to George Washington. Lafayette helped negotiate the, um, the, tre the, the treaty with the with the French, because he was a French nobleman, and helped bring um, bring French support to the Americans and help win the American Revolution. Washington, George Washington was very close to the Marquis de Lafayette, considered him like a son. And so during the American Revolution in 1779, George Washington commissioned this portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette uh, for to hang at home at Mount Vernon. And it shows Lafayette, and this portrait is actually owned by Washington and Lee University, another of our wonderful partners uh, that we work with here. This is the original that hung at Mount Vernon, and it shows Lafayette basically in a tent, um, and you can see the red around him, um, but you can also see him in his American uniform here. Um, and so the Marquis de Lafayette was painted beginning in 1779, 
The portrait itself was not finished until 1780. There's back and forth correspondence between George Washington and Charles Wilson Peel about the painting of this portrait. And they were not sure exactly where uh, the scene in the background was. It's sort of a generic scene in the background. We have wonderful, you can see out of the Marquis de Lafayette's tent to, um, to a, a, a field there with lots of little individual tents that would have been uh, stayed in by uh, individual soldiers during the revolution. I want to point out this little table here to you. Uh, this table is one that the Museum of the American Revolution did reproduce using this painting. Um, and it is, it holds various documents and a tricorn hat that belonged to Lafayette. Um, this is one that, uh, that particular size of table didn't survive. So they chose to reproduce it using the details of this portrait. Charles Wilson Peel was a very important, he was from Maryland and Philadelphia. He was the artist of the American Revolution. He served under Washington during the revolution and he's the first person to paint George Washington. You also see another portrait over here to the side of George Washington. Uh, it was, again, this was also painted in 1779. Our version is a little bit later. There are a number of copies of this, but uh, painted of Washington after the Battle of Princeton. So a couple of very important portraits showing uh, Washington and Lafayette. Thanks, Adam. I love that you mentioned that uh, our project sometimes involved meticulously copying actual things that still exist, like the camp bedstead. But in other cases, we had to triangulate what Washington had. You know, we know that he had tables. We know, as far as we know, maybe someone here has one in their attic. As far as we know, none of them survive. But we could look at paintings like this one and others by Peel to imagine, you know, what did a folding camp table look like? So you mentioned common soldiers. They're going to sleep. Uh, just on the ground under these common tents. Washington, as we've already learned, has this encampment that really, I think, speaks to his, um, you know, both his Republican Spartan simplicity, but also the sense of refinement he wanted to present when you dined with him or when you met him, the sort of experience you had, the sort of material culture objects you would have encountered. And that included even silverware, right, Adam? Absolutely. And so, I brought out two spoons that George Washington purchased during the midst of the American Revolution. They were made by the Philadelphia silversmith Richard Humphreys. Um, and these are, they, they're very large, but these are tablespoons like we would use on the table today. Um, they are really large, but they are uh, wonderful. And Washington bought two dozen of these for use during uh, during the revolution and then brought them back here to Mount Vernon. On the top, they have Washington's crest from his coat of arms, which Washington understood to be a griffin on top of a coronet, a very English sensibility to continue to use the crest from his aristocratic coat of arms. And then this wonderful feather edge on the outside, really hearkening to the coming neoclassical style. On the back, each of these is stamped with the name of the silversmith, Richard Humphreys, who was a Quaker in Philadelphia um, during the American Revolution. And he hammered each of these spoons up and made it individually uh, for Washington to use. So we know there were two dozen of these. Many of them survive today. Uh, Washington used silver on his table. He would have kept a very refined table um, and the silver itself would have been, um, would have been, they didn't know exactly why it did this at the time, but silver is anti uh, sort of bacterial. So it kills some bacteria that are in, that's out in the environment. Um, so these, we can only imagine the people who would have dined using these spoons, certainly the Marquis de Lafayette and George Washington. So they really are important objects, but they show off Washington's status again with that crest you see there. So these objects, as we know by now, became, you know, Adam mentioned, be, they become relics, they become treasured mementos of historic events. So I'll take you back into the center of the encampment for one moment, just to allow you to imagine the end of the war and Washington returning to his home in Mount Vernon. 
these tents, his camp equipment, they're packed away uh, in part because Washington's not entirely sure that he won't have to take the field again. As we know, you know, the 1780s, the 1790s are troubled times in the new Republic and internationally. So will he need to use his tents again? He's pretty adamant that they need to be carefully stored. They need to be aired out, well-preserved. And then even after his death, they're taken care of by his descendants so that they they become um, historic in their own right. And that continues until today. So before I do the big reveal on our end, I wanted to give Adam a chance to show you guys two really amazing examples of Washington relics and how their uh, how memory sort of influenced what happened to them next after the Revolutionary War. So I have in front of me two wonderful fragments of uh, of the tent. One is the wooden frame that you see here, and the other is the piece of fabric that you see there. Um, the wooden frame is a uh, is made. It is a piece. It is oak that is made from one of the stakes from George Washington that kept George Washington's tent held up, um, and it was crafted um, sometime in the 19th century to hold a fragment of Washington's porcelain uh, ser dinner service. Apparently one of the platters, very much like this one, broke. And so the person wanted to keep it as a relic of Washington. And they created this wonderful little, um, little frame to hold it. And there's a little note on the back side that, that explains what it is. And so what it actually holds is actually very much relevant to the American Revolution. It holds a piece of porcelain from the service called the Society of the Cincinnati Service. When Washington was in camp in Newburgh, New York, the various officers got together at the end of the American Revolution and decided they wanted to create a fraternal organization that continued the cause of the American Revolution and advocated for people who had fought under Washington. They called this the Society of the Cincinnati. The Society Cincinnati was named after Cincinnatus, the ancient Roman general who fought and freed the Roman Republic. But then rather than maintain power, he turned the um, turned power over to the civilian authority. And so in this instance, Washington, um, Washington and all of his soldiers, when they went back home, were thought of as Cincinnatus figures. Washington purchased this porcelain set that has the emblems of the society. Uh, at the end of the American Revolution, right after the American Revolution, and he used it uh, for the next 20 years of his life, both at Mount Vernon and during the presidency uh, when he when he um, was in Philadelphia and in New York City. So at some point, this this it's highly the the service is highly identified with George Washington. At some point, one of the platters broke. And they decided to preserve it in this really wonderful way, which you see oftentimes in the 19th century. Also, this other element that you see here, this piece of fabric, this is a piece of one of Washington's tents. Um, and it's a twill weave sort of linen fabric that is one that um, was cut from one of Washington's tents. Um, and so there were a number of these that were cut out and kept as souvenirs. Uh, we see this over and over again in the 19th century. Everybody wants a piece of George and Martha Washington, and so they get fragments like this. We have a number of Martha Washington's dresses that were done in a very similar way, as well as some of Washington's waistcoats. So these are very much relics um, from the 19th century that continued that history and continued the importance of the story of, of the American Revolution well into the 19th and even into the 20th century. So I feel a little intimidated because Adam has definitely had the coolest number of things. And I wanted to see if I could one up him a little bit by showing you the biggest cool thing. Although I have to admit the house at Mount Vernon is bigger than what I'm about to show you, but I'm in the Allen B. Miller theater. I've been showing you a deceptive projection from a film about Washington's tent. And now I wanted to show you the real tent, which still survives. Washington's tent was carefully preserved and it's been here since we opened in 2017. This is his actual marquee tent in this theater behind a glass wall, 
directly behind me. It's about 23 feet long, about 12 feet tall. So it's a long oval. We've been looking at that virtual version of it. And now we're seeing the real thing. It's pretty amazing that, you know, just like a number of the other things we saw this evening, that this still survives, that we can look at it and imagine what it looked like in the field. It originally would have been held taut under rope tension uh, to sort of suspend it and spread it out. But we couldn't do that with the real tent. We don't want to strain it too much. So it's actually resting on a pretty elaborate umbrella-like skeleton frame that's adjustable. So it gives the illusion of being suspended and under tension, but it's actually just being cradled on that framework. If you visited the museum, you've seen this for yourself, but it's it's absolutely my favorite thing here. It's part of an amazing immersive film experience uh, that reveals the tent at the end. So without further ado, I understand that um, we are going to be taking some questions from all of you this evening, and I'm going to pass it back to Adam, but not before I take the chance to see this thing myself, because it never gets old being able to be this close, as Adam knows, to something that Washington and Lafayette and William Lee and thousands of people whose names we don't know would have passed by and noticed or not noticed in the midst of the American Revolution. Thank you, Tyler, and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. If you have questions, feel free to, in, to uh, type them into the chat feature here. I'm going to read the questions, and Tyler and I will answer them. So from Ginger, we have, uh, where would the tent be located in relation to the battlefield? Was it close by? That's a great question, Ginger. So the tent, as much as I've said, it's, you know, not very ostentatious. It's pretty obvious that it's an important person's tent. You know, it's somebody, maybe not Washington, but Lafayette or Hamilton, big tent. Uh, it seems like they only set it up when they were quite confident that it was in a safe place, well behind the lines or some place that was distant and deep within the encampment so it wasn't exposed to a sudden raid. Washington was often in danger during the war. And it seems like in that case, he might have stayed in a house or there are even accounts of him actually Actually, sleeping under the stars when they were on the move really rapidly in the midst of the war. Tyler, could you tell them a little bit about the wonderful drawing that the Museum of the American Revolution acquired of the line five drawing, I guess it is? I would love that. Yeah. So uh, on our website, you can find resources under the title Among His Troops, which is the name of an exhibition we conducted in 2018 and a beautifully illustrated catalog about an incredible panoramic watercolor. It's only about 10 inches high, but it's several feet long, uh, drawn as we were able to figure out through some pretty interesting detective work by a French military officer, Pierre Charles Enfant, who as some of you may know, goes on to design Washington DC, sketched in 1782 at Verplanck's Point, New York, a kind of um, lesser known encampment of the Continental Army, the fall of 1782, up the Hudson River Valley. And for reasons unknown to us on a bright day in August or September, L'Enfant sat down on a hillside and he sketched the long continental encampment, which was really impressive. They had built elaborate bowers, these sort of um, kind of Adirondack furniture-like structures, maybe to impress the visiting French military officers. And up on a hill to one side, in the very same point that maps show us was the location of Washington's headquarters, is a small depiction of Washington's tent with one of these bowers in front of it. And the reason that's so exciting, besides being essentially a street view, a Google street view of a Continental Army encampment, is that up until we purchased that watercolor at auction in 2017, there was no known wartime depiction of Washington's tent. So all these people who wrote about Washington's tent, meeting him in the tent, all these people who saw it afterwards and <laughs> chopped pieces off of it for their souvenir albums, nobody during the war that we had known until this point had ever drawn what it looked like in the field and what it might have seemed like up there on that hill. So we were really excited to acquire that and to display as part of the exhibition. You guys can explore um, more on our website about that as well. All righty. From David, was the tent previously on display at the Valley Forge Museum? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you have long memories of history institutions in this part of the world, you may have seen this tent 
uh, at the Valley Forge Historical Society, which was a predecessor organization of ours, actually, a private nonprofit at the Valley Forge Cathedral in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Or you might have actually seen it at the National Park Service Center at Valley Forge, where it was on loan for a little while. Alternatively, to make it even more complicated, you've probably seen parts of Washington's tent on display at places like Mount Vernon that have displayed souvenir pieces. The inner chamber is an, on display at the National Park Service site at Yorktown. And the dining tent has been on and off display at the Smithsonian. So to your question, this one behind me probably is the one you saw at Valley Forge. But if other folks see, think they've seen Washington's tent other places, they're probably actually right because there are several tents that move around. All righty. What does the process look like for putting up a tent like this? Well, Adam, you you have helped us a few times. It's uh, how would you how would you describe it in one word, Adam? What do you think? Arduous. <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. Arduous is good. Uh, complicated. Um, so the short version is you have these two upright poles, and there's one big pole on the top that connects them. So you kind of plant those in the ground, and you have this like Iwo Jima flag raising moment where you pull on these ropes, and the, the tent raises up very dramatically, and then you run all around hammering ropes in, you hang all the walls off. If, you know, one of the questions we wanted to ask when we made these reproductions was how long did it take to set up? Because that's not the sort of thing people wrote down in the 18th century. And a big reason we did this was to answer questions like that or questions that we can't answer with the real thing. How warm is it inside? How soundproof is it? How waterproof is the tent? These days, if we have maybe like half a dozen people who know what they're doing, we can set up the sleeping tent replica in about two or three hours. So you can imagine if you had 30 or 40 people doing it like it was their job for two years of the war, and you know their motivation is to get that tent set up, get the dining tent set up so they can get their own tent, tent set up and go to sleep, um, they probably got pretty good and pretty fast at it. But after the war, that memory is entirely lost. So even today, even to set this tent up in this theater where it's permanently installed, we had to do a lot of kind of reverse engineering and puzzling about which pieces went where and how it would all fit together like a big puzzle. Would Martha have stayed in the tent? That's a good question. Yeah. Rather. Yeah, so uh, Martha Washington did visit George most winters of the Revolution War. I think, Adam, is that correct? Or maybe even every winter of the Revolution every winter, War? Every, every winter, winter she came and stayed with me. But my understanding about that is they were in pretty much in a house at that point, And they set up, the tent might have been set up outside, but they would have, been, they would have stayed in the house together. I think that's right, yeah. I, we have no evidence that Martha ever stayed in the tent or visited Washington at a time when he was only in the tent. It doesn't mean she didn't, you know, that the absence of evidence is not proof, but um, we don't know for sure that she ever stayed in the tent. She almost certainly dined in the dining tent. She would have been familiar with these tents. Did she ever sleep under their canvas? Not that we know of. Well, just look at the width of the bed. It doesn't fit two people. <laughs> it barely fits just Washington. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty short. He's a tall guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the next question from Lynn is, I understand Washington held war councils with his several generals. With, where would the generals have stayed? Hmm. So it's interesting, you know, Washington's marquee, the one that survives, this is called a marquee tent, is not actually um, bigger or any different from the tents that we know other generals had. So other important officers had marquee tents as far as we can imagine, identical to Washington's. Maybe a little smaller, but they had inner chambers, they had these multiple rooms. And that was true of you know, really high ranking officers. And then the lower you got, the maybe more likely you were to share a tent. So you might see two or three staff officers sharing a tent. But what makes that conclusion difficult to know for sure is that of the thousands of tents that, you, that were used, made, uh, transported around during the Revolutionary War, this one behind me and the one at the Smithsonian and the piece of it at the National Park Service of Yorktown, those Washington tents, those are the only tents from the Revolutionary War that still exist. So we don't, we know what Washington's was like, but we don't necessarily know if 
parts were totally unique to Washington's tents or if what we're seeing on this one is representative of all the other tents that other officers used. Interesting. Uh, did you state that Lafayette and Frank subsidized the war as American people ran out of money? Also, was the furniture in Washington's tent made out of cherry wood and oak? Um, so Lafayette and Lafayette and Frank. So France sent certainly sent assistance to the American cause during uh, the American Revolution in the form of the French Navy, in the form of the French Army. We're talking uh, in. We have, and we're, we're really talking about, uh, this was when we were talking about the portrait. Um, so yeah, they, they sent, certainly sent support. Um, also was the furniture in Washington's, which would have been both monetary and uh, sort of military support. They sent the uh, sent people, Lafayette came on his own, uh, didn't really have permission to come, but eventually the, they sent officially sanctioned uh, people in, including Admiral de Grasse, uh, Comte de Rochambeau, uh, all of these people came over with the sanction of the French crown. So yes, there was a lot of assistance. Also was the furniture in Washington's tent made of cherry wood or oak. Um, this is partially mahogany. Um, there are a number of different woods. This we think is an English made bed um, that was imported to America at some point. Um, there are a variety of woods, including mahogany, which is sort of the nicest wood you could have had. Uh, it looks like there's some oak in here as well. It might interest in folks uh, to know as well, Adam, that the tent poles of Washington's tent, which also survive, are also mahogany. Uh, probably partly status symbol, but also partly because it was really rot resistant. It's a tropical hardwood. So it's yes. a great wood for a, a tent that's you know going to have these poles sitting on wet ground for years at a time. Uh, Cynthia asked, were any pets uh, in the encampments allowed in the tent? Wow, great. I, you know, I don't think I've ever gotten that question before. That's really interesting. So you read during the Revolutionary War um, occasionally about pets. Some of us might have seen these portraits of uh, especially young boys with a little squirrel on a silver chain with a collar. Um, you read about dogs. In fact, there's an amazing account of the Revolutionary War about um, dogs that belong to a British general arriving in the Continental Army encampment and then Washington returning them to the British general because they, their collars were marked. And there are a few dog collars that still exist from the Revolutionary War with regimental officers' names on them. But I can't say whether I've ever seen an account of uh, someone wanting to bring their dog into Washington's tent and how he might have reacted to that. I mean, Adam, we know that Washington was he was probably a dog person, I suppose we he could say. A dog person had many dogs here at Mount Vernon, but I certainly don't, I don't imagine you would take your dog to Washington. <laughs> we have had dogs in the replica tent, so if you ever come to see the replica, feel free to to bring your dogs. I guess. <laughs> Can you tell us about the general's headquarters standard? And this comes from Dean Melissa. Oh, Dean Melissa. I feel like some of us here may have heard from of him. Uh, Dean, as many of you may know, is um, the preeminent portrayer of George Washington, our favorite George Washington, if I can say that, maybe not too loudly around here, but has often been George Washington uh, in front of and inside the replica marquee at Mount Vernon's Revolutionary War weekend. So really happy to hear from Dean. So as Dean may know, and others of you might have seen, Washington carried a specific flag, a small, maybe about two by three foot standard, it was called. And that flag, a light blue silk with applied stars, six pointed stars, just like the logo of the Museum of the American Revolution, kind of looks like the corner of an American flag, although there's no evidence that it was connected, maybe just sort of similar inspiration. That flag would have traveled with Washington around the field, been outside his tent, um, not unlike you know, when the queen is in Buckingham Palace, the flag is up, and when she's not home, the flag isn't there. Sort of a marker of his presence. And I'm really excited that we actually have the original flag that belonged to George Washington here at the museum. We don't display it because it's incredibly light sensitive. It was under bright lights for a long time at the Valley Forge Historical Society that we were talking about. So it is um, tissue paper thin, 
very, very fragile. It was carefully conserved by an amazing textile conserver named Virginia Whalen. So it's been stabilized, but oh, oh, awesome. Here it is. So there's the um, commander in chief standard. We have a replica on display on the first floor of our museum. So you may have seen one there. And this flag, uh, since we've opened, we've only brought it out once for a short weekend, for a really special weekend, so that we could display it um, very briefly. One of, I think, again, the most iconic special artifacts related to Washington that we have here at the museum. We're looking for the next question. Here we go. How did the, from Mark, how did the two of you obtain such deep knowledge of the Revolutionary War, how many years of study? <laughs> Tyler, I'll let you go first. Wow, uh, well, I don't know. Between Adam and I, we probably have a couple decades worth of <laughs> experience. Uh, well, speaking for myself, you know, I um, I am living the nine-year-old versions of, version of myself's wildest dreams. I My parents took me to museums. I went to historic sites as a kid, and I used to look at the people who worked there and think like what an incredible job that would be to tell people stories about the Revolutionary War all day. And so um, I ended up going to college. And then as Adam mentioned, we both went through the Winterthur program in American material culture for graduate school. Uh, and then I went, went back to school for more work before I started here at the museum. Um, but I actually interned for the museum in 2013 when we made the replica tents at Colonial Williamsburg. So that was one of my grad school internships was sewing this weird tent for a museum that hadn't opened yet and might someday in Philadelphia become something and and then i uh, ended up working here what about you adam a similar different origin story so it was it was from the time i was a child i remember going and seeing going to colonial williamsburg and seeing all of the historic houses i was always interested in the interiors of, of spaces and uh, went to college and uh studied american studies and then went to the winter program in american material culture and it was always a dream to sort of be a curator and work with the authentic objects and to uh to gain knowledge from them by looking closely at them and finding out what they could tell us about the past um went to the winter program in Ameri american material culture as uh tyler was the year above me and um so we went we were both in that program and then i came to mount vernon where i've been i've worked for nine years uh as assistant curator and I'm now curator of fine and decorative arts and in, in that job I have the opportunity to come down here into storage and look at these incredible objects and take them out and to see what I can we, we, we can see by close looking at them so it's I mean all of this is a continuing process of education and anytime you pull out an object there's something to learn from it I think yeah, I mean, what what better job at, you know, what is it, 745 on a Monday night, we get to be this close to things that um, Washington and his world use. I mean, how, how cool is that? <laughs> it's very cool. So from Scarlet, we have, aside from Washington's war tent, what is your favorite artifact from your respective historical sites and why? Wow. You got a good one, Adam, or, or I've got a good one off the bat. And you know, okay. the thing about the thing about it is, I, I would always say is my favorite object is the object I'm studying at the moment. So, <laughs> um, and actually, this one links right into the man who's right here, the Marquis de Lafayette. So, the Marquis de Lafayette goes back to France, then comes back to Mount Vernon and visits for a little while, and he meets um, two uh, two of the Washington grandchildren. Sorry, that's the lights. We have them. They go off at a certain point um, to protect things. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, so they go off a certain point. Um, so Lafayette goes back to, go, comes and visits Mount Vernon, and he meets Martha Washington's grandchildren. There are four grandchildren uh, that she has by her, uh, through her first husband um, and grandchildren. Their uh, father, Jackie Custis, dies during the American Revolution, and Martha, George and Martha, raised the youngest two at Mount Vernon. And one of the interesting stories about that is that when Lafayette came here, one of the one of the grandchildren recounts that when Lafayette came to Mount Vernon, the grandchildren were so excited to see him because they wanted to see if he looked like this portrait here. 
But the object I'm most uh, that is my favorite right now is was sent by the the Marquise de Lafayette, the Marquis wife, uh, to the grandchildren. It's something we've recently acquired. It's a little dressing table that was sent by the Marquise de Lafayette. It's a child sized table sent by the Marquise de Lafayette to the grandchild uh, to one of Martha Washington's granddaughters. It was in uh, it was given to Peck. Patty, uh, Patty Custis, who becomes Patty Custis Peter. And in the 19th century, the family members put a little note inside the top. It says that this was a this was a gift from the Marquis de Lafayette after the American Revolution. And we have the wonderful letter from the Marquise de Lafayette sending it to the to the child. Um, and it's a remarkable object. It's going to be on display when we reinstall the permanent collection in the museum. Tyler, what's your favorite object? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, you know, uh, one of my favorite things about working here is that a lot of our objects are on loan. So about 50% of the things we display are only with us for a short time. So uh, right now at Stone's Throw from where I am, there's uh, Deborah Sampson's wedding dress, the dress worn by a twice wounded Continental Army veteran, a woman who had disguised herself as a man, returned to Massachusetts, got married in this gown in 1785. That's here. We've got um, an amulet dropped at a backwater Pennsylvania fort called Fort Shirley, which has a Muslim inscription on it. So probably worn by an enslaved or free person of African descent in the 1750s in Western Pennsylvania. Um, but I think maybe the short version is my favorite object that we have uh, is a punch bowl broken into a bunch of different pieces and dug out of a privy, a toilet that was about 85 feet below where I'm sitting that we found in our archeological excavations. It's called the Trifina Bowl because of the name of the ship on it. And I love that object because it, it just has so many stories to tell about the Stamp Act, about Quakers, about illegal taverns, about the freeing of an enslaved woman named Quanchaba who lived in the household who would have carried this punch bowl um, and I just love that it was an everyday object that we had no idea we were going to un uncover until we built the museum. So we get to tell this really local, surprising story using that thing. That's wonderful. That, that is a beautiful object. It's really, really interesting. So um, the, the, I just want to wrap up and say thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. It's been a really remarkable tour and a really remarkable partnership between these two organizations that have a really great friendship and a great synergy uh, between each other. It's a pleasure to be here with Tyler tonight, um, but I also want to remind all of you members uh, to go see the Museum of the American Revolution, to come here to Mount Vernon. If you want to come to Revolutionary War Weekend, which is this weekend, please uh, be sure to reserve your tickets early. Um, for members, they are free. Please reserve your tickets because we have limited attendance because of COVID precautions. So please uh, do reserve those tickets. And remember that 30% offer that will get you, if you're a member at Mount Vernon or a member at the Museum of the American Revolution, you get 30% off your ticket. And it's an easy, it's an easy day trip. If you live in the area, want to go up to Philadelphia or want to come down here to Mount Vernon, each of these places is an easy day trip and you'll see lots of connections between the two. We always have changing exhibitions and there's always something new to see at each one of these institutions. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tyler, uh, for joining us in front of the war tent. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone.